one of the big lessons in life for me was watching my father. It didn't matter if he didn't want to box or he didn't want to be a champion or he didn't have any great ability. As long as you were coming along, keeping fit and joining in, that was important. Welcome back to Mulligan Brothers. Today's video, as always, was sponsored by Huel. I'm drinking Huel Black Edition, which has 26 vitamins and minerals, 35 grams of protein and slow release carbs to make sure that I can stay satiated and proteined up whilst I make these documentaries. If you want to find out more about these, go to the link in the description. I'll talk about them a little bit later on in the video. Just for those who don't know, just introduce yourself and what you do. My name is Frank Gilfeather. I am now a boxing coach, courtesy of social media, but I've had more than 70 years in boxing. So some people might think I know what I'm talking about. What year did you move to Aberdeen? What year? 1969. And was there a reason that brought, brought you into Aberdeen at the time? Yes, to, yeah. I, I was a journalist. I, was a, I moved to Aberdeen in 1969 uh, because of my work as a newspaper journalist. Uh, I was a news reporter, did some feature writing, and then I went into sport. And I worked on the, the morning paper here, the Press and Journal, and the evening paper, the Evening Express. And they were among the biggest regional newspapers in the UK at the time. It was a very exciting time. I really loved the day-to-day -day difference being a news reporter. You weren't dealing with the same stories every single day. Every day was new. If you were to describe um, to an American audience the area that you grew up in, how would you, how would you describe that? Well, I grew up in an area called Loch e, which is in the city of Dundee on the east coast of uh, Scotland. And uh, that area, Loch e, was famous, if you like, for its jute industry. Now, you know, in, in the centuries gone by, in the decades gone by, there were more than 100 jute mills in the city of Dundee, employing something like 114,000 mainly women. And uh, the place where I kind of grew up uh, was a place called Tipperary. Uh, a, a very poor part of Loch e, and it was called Tipperary because in the early days, most of the people who went there to get housing and jobs with the Cox jute mill, uh, they were Irish. And so it was just nicknamed Tipperary. And, and so it evolved. People came from Glasgow, many of them women who walked from Glasgow to Dundee 85 miles in search of work. It was very straitened times. Not when I grew up, of course. That was kind of post-war. Things were rosy. There was uh, local authority housing going up all over the place. And at that time, with a new government after the war, it seemed like the sun always shone. Is this this area, is it reminiscent of anything like when you're growing up or is it, you know, we've spoken about sort of, it's, it's on a bit of a downturn. Was that at any point in your life? a moment where this would have been reminiscent of the areas you grew up or you was living around? So in the, the early 60s and beyond, areas like this started to spring up in Dundee, uh, where I was born and where I was raised, and it changed everything. In fact, my granny, who lived in Tipperary in a two-room house with an outside toilet, she was eventually kind of decamped to a, a, a tower block. Everybody thought it was fantastic. When I came up to Aberdeen in 1969, things began to change, generally speaking. Why? Because about 1971-72, oil was discovered in the North Sea. And Aberdeen became one of the most cosmopolitan cities in Europe. In fact, it was known as the oil capital of Europe because we had, we had all kinds of uh, companies and organizations coming from the States who were setting up headquarters for their UK offices here in Aberdeen. And what it meant was huge employment chances and opportunities for the people of the city, which went from being a, a key fishing port, the biggest in Europe at one time, and would produce granite for just about every building you see in, in Aberdeen. The granite city is what we call it. And suddenly we were an oil town and a big one at that, and people made fortunes, and people took their opportunity to get ahead in life thanks to North Sea Oil. 
something we've seen a lot of up uh, in Invergordon, because that's a massive oil, oil industry. Like all our friends up there are from the oil industry. Yeah, well, so, yeah. there's a guy up there um, called Roy McGregor. I seem, uh, yeah, well, uh, McGregor's quite strong there, I guess. Yeah, well, he's got global energy, right? Roy, I, he's, a, he's a lovely guy. He's one of the richest men in Scotland. He owns uh, Ross County Football Club in Dingwall, but he, he's he made his fortune. At um, oh, and I must give you one of these. I mean, it's terribly boring. It's about Ross County, but there's a really interesting stuff on Roy McGregor and how he made his millions. And it was starting supplying the the oil rigs that sat in Invergordon uh, Bay, so that he can. What do you need? Oh, and we need boots, sandwiches, hats, anything. I'll get them for you. Wow. Yeah. Today's episode, as always, was powered by Huel. This stuff has been absolutely crucial to my training and the world record I just broke, the world's heaviest marathon, where I carried 220 pounds for 28 miles. Yes, I achieved it, guys. It is done. This is what I was drinking, Huel Black Edition. It has 35 grams of protein, 26 vitamins and minerals and slow release carbs. And it's what I use in my training all the time. But don't just take my word for it. People like the hardest geezer ran across Africa drinking this stuff. It's absolutely amazing. And if you want to get exclusive offers and deals, go to the link in the description and you can find out more about their other products like their daily greens and their meals, which I eat every single lunchtime. Thank you to Huel for sponsoring the video. And let's dive back in to the episode. I'm curious, you know, you speak about... You, you mentioned some of the women would walk 80 miles and yeah. um, it just, to me, it sounds like a generation that's just, this gets it done, hard working. Yeah. I'm curious, the, the generation that in, like you got to see growing up and you know, were a part of as well yeah. versus the generation today, do you think, is there something missing? Is there, is there a difference in it? And uh, what yeah. was the effect it had on you seeing that? I guess one of the big lessons in life for me was watching my father. His name was Dennis Gilfeather and he ran, over decades, he ran a series of boxing clubs, amateur boxing clubs. And his ethos was to take young boys, and it's pretty much the same just now, off the streets, and now young women, and give them something meaningful in their lives. And it kept them away from trouble, away from petty crime, and all the stuff that young kids at 14, 15, 16 would get up to. And, and it, gave them a, it gave them a kind of feeling of belonging. I belong to, for instance, his first club, um, after the Camper Down Club, which was in the jute mill, in the canteen, we established, or he established, the Lochie Amateur Boxing Club. So what you got was, and I was four years old when I started to go along there and kind of take part in the training. But for me, it was a learning thing. It was the smell of the sweat. It was a listening to the thumps of the bags. And remember, in those days, the punch bags were sailors' kit bags stuffed with sawdust, packed tightly with sawdust and you could hear the thumping. They were hung by a piece of rope from rafters. And these guys with their white vests on and their black shirts and their plimsolls were trying to make the grade as boxers. But you know, that didn't matter for my dad. It didn't matter if he didn't want to box or he didn't want to be a champion or he didn't have any great ability. As long as you were coming along, keeping fit and joining in, that was important. 